Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Principal Church. Good morning, um, first time comers. We will be starting our sermon series on 1 Corinthians. And uh, as we begin this, I'd like to start off today in a sermon with a fun little survey, a short little survey. So, in, as our slides uh, are getting ready to be shown here. This is a survey that's going to basically tell something about who you are. All right. The first slide is, uh, the title of our sermon today is called, Whose Side Are You On? And this is basically an introduction to the first Corinthians. So as we go to our first slide, are you hockey? Do you like hockey or do you like football? Hands up. Hockey? Hands up football? Yeah. <laughs> Does it really matter for today with, uh, with the Super Bowl coming or, or a, a, yeah. well, this afternoon, right? Um, Next slide. Are you Coke or are you Pepsi? Oh, Coke. Coke. <laughs> wow, a, a lot of people say Coke. Next slide. Are you email or are you text message? Phone calls. Phone calls? Phone calls? <laughs> <laughs> I expect to. Just kidding. Yeah, you know, these days I think it's really text messaging. But anyway, next slide. Are you Team Captain America or are you Team Iron Man? This is an old one. This is, what was last year? <laughs> I didn't bring up Batman versus Superman because that movie wasn't as good. <laughs> Next slide. Are you Hawaii versus Europe? Most of you like the sun, huh? Tropical, tropical environment. I agree. Hawaii. And last slide. Are you Trump? Or <laughs> Trump or Obama? That's a tough one. <laughs> well, the reason I, I went through this um, exercise. It's just basically to demonstrate that we, we have this ability to choose. We're given this free will by God um, to be able to choose every moment uh, and make choices in our lives. Sometimes it's you know the mundane. You wake up, you put on your socks, um, you go downstairs, um, and you have either a bowl of cereal or some toast. You know those are easy ch um, choices. Uh, we don't even have to think about it. But then there are those harder choices, um, more complicated choices in life, like who should I vote for in the next election? What career should I take? Or who should I marry? Or, or what faith or religion should I follow? And many, many times, we are given a, a few options, and we, we narrow it down basically to one of two choices, right? And then when we, we come down to these two choices, we usually make this choice uh, or this decision based on how we were brought up. You know, what car I buy, the person I marry, the faith I follow. Those are influential in making these decisions. But you know what? It goes a little bit deeper than, than just cultural values. You know, being raised in an Asian household or in uh, in Western Canada or in North America. There's this more encompassing term, um, and we're going to call it worldview. So the definition of worldview that I'm going to give you for today is this. Worldview is a mental model of reality. It's this comprehensive framework of ideas and attitudes about the world, ourselves, life, systems of belief, a system of personally customized theories about the world and how it actually works. So worldview is, is definitely a dominant influencer in, in shaping our decisions, our actions, um, while, we, while we're living in, and interacting in this world. And I want you to hold on to this concept, just park it for a little while because I'm going to return to this uh, later on uh, when we look at our uh, passage in First Corinthians chapter 1. So I'll get back to this in just a second, in, or in a few minutes. 
But as we begin our series sermon on 1 Corinthians, we need to do a little bit of uh, background work here. And so hopefully we'll be able to understand uh, what's the big deal about this city called Corinth and, and the Christians that are living there in this city. So let's start off with a background of uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, next slide. So here's a, a map of uh, ancient Near East during uh, Paul's time. And this is specifically a map of Paul's second missionary journey. So he starts out on you know, your left hand, or sorry, your right hand, um, over there from Jerusalem. You can follow the aerials. He goes up through um, the coast there and up through Asia, all the way up to, on the top left corner, Philippi. Get the, uh, the letters of Philippi, uh, Philippians, and then you'll over over to the left. He'll travel over to Thessalonica, uh, or Thessalonica, and everyone produce, uh, pronounce that. And then he makes his way south towards Greece, and eventually arrives at this city that we're talking about today, which is Corinth. So Corinth is this city that's about 50 miles west of Athens, and it's located on an isthmus. You guys remember what an isthmus is? from, I don't know, grade eight, grade nine geography. It's basically a, 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 a thin body of land, uh, not surrounded by, but on two sides, there are, there's basically bodies of water. And so Corinthians, if you can see it, is in, is in this isthmus that connects southern Greece to northern Greece. Now this was a very, very uh, crucial point, very, um, it was basically a commercial hub where if you wanted to go to, to Rome, you would travel through this isthmus instead of traveling all the way around south of Greece. You would travel on one side of the isthmus, take your boat maybe out of, uh, out of the water, drag it across for about three and a half miles to the other side, and then keep sailing on. So that would occur both going east to west and then west to east. And so you can see how Corinth was this um, trade route city. It's a very, very fabulously wealthy city. It was actually one of the largest cities in first century Greece, and one of the largest in the in the Roman Empire. The population was somewhere around well, there were about two hundred and fifty thousand free people, or free persons, and then add on to that four hundred thousand slaves. Can you imagine that? That's that's quite a big city. Its citizens included native Greeks, you had a uh, Jewish population, uh, and some other Orientals, not, not Asian, Chinese, but Orientals. <laughs> um, there were Roman settlers, uh, government officials, and businessmen, of course. This, this city, Corinth, was the capital city of the Roman province called Achaia. And basically, if you wanted to travel through here, or like I said, if you wanted to travel by, uh, by boat from anywhere over the east to get to Rome, you would go through this, this hub here of Corinth. So Corinth's history. Corinth was basically, I'll give you a really short picture of Corinth's history. It was, it was basically a city that existed for uh, many centuries and it was destroyed by Rome in 146 BC. About 100 years later, in 46 BC, Caesar rebuilt it, and then Corinth gradually grew and retained its uh, prominence as a, the center of industry and trade. Corinth's culture. Corinth's culture was comprised of these things that I've, I've listed for you here. And is something that was predominantly Athenian in philosophy. So uh, philosophers like Socrates and Plato. What does that mean? Well, it means that they had value. They placed value on the arts, speech, rhetorical skills, wisdom. And basically, they had this, this idea of competition amongst who's the smartest and who's the brightest. Some philosophies that um, Corinthian culture 
um, you know, the way they, they, they thought uh, included stoicism, cynicism, and skepticism. So what's stoicism? It's this belief that the world is beyond our control as individuals. You know, all things are already determined. There's no good or evil, just an all-powerful, impersonal, cosmic logic that causes everything into being. Sort of sounds like what Spock would say or something like that. So we all, we all must create this inward stability this um, in order to forsake pleasure and sorrow. And you can see how you know, this, this way of thinking, um, this would fall contrary to a, a Christian God who loves us, who answers prayer, who wants a personal relationship with his creation and even grants us free will. So that's stoicism. Cynicism. Cynics are, are people who are radical activists. They're, they're people that believe in the freedom to act and speak. And you know they, they ridicule those that are, are uh, who conform to the accepted social uh, standards, the radical activists. And then skepticism. Skeptics, this way of thinking, they mocked knowledge, believe it or not. They believe that um, they believe in a personal freedom. Um, they believe that knowledge came from experience things. And since experiences are unique to individuals, uh, that there could be actually no truth that applies to everybody. So there, when you hear somebody being skeptical, it's because they're, they're saying, well, you know, that truth doesn't apply to you, and it's my own experience, and your truth is not true for me. That's the, that's the way of thinking. So that's a little bit of the way of uh, thinking going around there. And then we, the next point there is religious syncretism. Can you see that with me? Religious syncretism. <laughs> this is your word of the day. <laughs> what is syncretism? Basically, this is uh, the belief that all deities, all gods, and religious systems ultimately, ultimately are amounted to the same thing. There's this one overarching spiritual reality, but there are innumerable ways to get that in and to express that. So if you think about it, in the Roman Empire, this is an empire that conquered many kings in small, small and big kingdoms. And each of them, you know, these areas and sections of the Roman Empire had their own religious beliefs. So they just basically melded all these religions together, you know, take, taking the best, right? You know, basically Rome pop, uh, bit off of Greek mythology, right? Because if you have, uh, it was originally Zeus, and Jupiter is the equivalent in, in Roman mythology, and, and so forth. So you think of it as people just adding gods and beliefs that the way they want it, sort of like it's religious buffet, uh, religious belief. That's religious syncretism. But you know, above religion and philosophy, Corinth was best known notoriously known for being a morally depraved city. There was immorality everywhere. And there was this expression, this, if you were living as a Corinthian um, in the Roman Empire, this was known as living an immoral lifestyle. This philosophy was, all things are, are there for our enjoyment since the soul is apart from the body. And this pervaded the culture. And this, this culture basically there was extensive and lucrative prostitution as a result of pagan worship. And you know, this is not surprising as they had a um, temple dedicated uh, directly to Aphrodite. So Aphrodite, if you remember, she's the goddess of love, uh, beauty, pleasure, procreation. And this temple was home to over a thousand uh, priestesses or prostitutes. You know, this moral climate in the city it basically contributed to the problems that the Corinthian church was experiencing during this day. Paul describes Corinthian uh, Christians as former idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexual offenders. You know, and 
I was, as I was doing my research, this is an interesting side note. One commentator said this about Corinth. The believer's faith was being tried in the crucible of immoral Corinth. And some of them were failing the test. Now, isn't that an uh, interesting way to use crucible, crucible church? And in this, this definition of crucible, it's a severe test. But there's another definition of crucible, a secondary definition, which is it's a place or a situation in which concentrated forces interact to cause or influence change or development. So I got a crucible church, and I'm just guessing it was named because of this second definition, right? And not this severe place of testing, because this is not a place of testing. This is a place of love, right? This is a place of encouragement. Something to think about. Sorry for, for that little tangent. So, lastly, there's there's a the Corinthian spiritual definition, or their own spiritual definition, and I'm just taking this directly from a, a Bible study that Pastor Jonathan led uh, a couple of weeks ago in the was that Thursday night. It is a mix of Stoicism, which I already mentioned, and Neoplatonism plus the wealth and influence of the elite minority. There's this idea of elevation of spirit over body and detachment from the chaotic world. And thus, they were like pleasure seekers and, and um, they're rich people exploiting the poor. Does this description of Corinth remind you of any place close? Does it remind you of Vancouver in a lot of ways? Even more specifically, in, in Richmond. Well, continuing on, in, in Paul's previous experience with Corinth, um, this is what he did. Basically, Paul came here in, in, in the, the map that I showed you earlier, um, down from uh, northern Greece, and into Corinth, and he stayed there uh, in Corinth for about 18 months uh, during his second uh, missionary journey. This is about 80, 52 to 53. And so Paul was about 50 years old at the time. And one thing you have to know about Paul is he not only had rabbinical um, education, but he also knew how to make tents. So he was a tent maker. And he came to this city. And while he was uh, doing ministry here, he partnered up with a couple of other tent makers. And their names were Achilla and, and Priscilla. And so Paul, during his, uh, his time there, was able to fund his ministry through his tent making. So he started off by coming and knocking the door of a, a Jewish synagogue uh, and, and basically preaching the gospel there. And when his time basically had worn out in that synagogue, he left uh, maybe you know, a few steps down um, next door and he started preaching there. But he also took with him uh, you know, some new believers as well as the synagogue leader, and his name was Christus. And so as time went on, little small groups of house churches basically grew over the city, as, a, as opposed to one large congregation, because there's no big enough place to meet. And as we will be later in Corinthians, this, this kind of segregation of groups would cause them to follow specific leaders, and then eventually have uh, promote a little bit of a division in the church body. And so what was, what's the occasion for Paul actually writing to the Corinthians, writing this epistle? Well, fast forward five years, and Paul is in the city of uh, Ephesus on his third missionary journey. And he hears some rumblings from the Corinthian congregation members. And so a group uh, comes to him and basically tells him, you know what, Corinth you know, people are following, people are fighting one another, and it's tearing the church apart. Not only that, Paul, Paul, they're questioning your authority, your leadership, your teaching. You know, at this time, Paul wasn't able to go 250 miles back to Corinthians. So he sat down and he partially dictated and, and wrote this, this letter to the Corinth, uh, Corinthian church. And he wanted basically to give them some positive guidance and also some correction for the, the variety of problems that this church was experiencing. So 
uh, Timothy ends up delivering this letter uh, to Corinth. And um, it's actually a, a series of letters or, or correspondence that is actually happening here. Um, what happens is Paul first writes to Corinth, uh, Corinthian church, and if we go to the next uh, slide, and this first letter is a lost document. And then the Corinthians write back to Paul. And then Paul replies. And this is what's known as 1 Corinthians. Paul writes again and with, and with what was called a painful letter. And then he writes a third time. And, and that's what's known as 2 Corinthians. So Corinth has this, this dubious distinction of being this confused group of believers. And in writing to Corinth, Paul's overall goal was to preach the truth of the cross-centered gospel and actually provide, like I said, that counsel, specific counsel for the, the numerous issues happening. Things like factions coming up, immorality, lawsuits, meets offered to idols, Abuses of the Lord's Supper, false prophets, or sorry, fa uh, false prophets or false uh, apostles, problems about marriage, disorderly conduct uh, uh, while in, in the assembly of the church, understanding women's role in the church, and then heresies about um, the resurrection. And so that I've given you a little bit of a background, and I'm sure as you begin your uh, Bible studies uh, in your small groups about uh, Corinthians that you know you'll you'll come into more about this um, this particular epistle. Um, I actually want to turn to our, our passage for today, and we can read this together. It's found in First Corinthians chapter one, verses ten through eighteen. I'll read it for you, starting with verse ten. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you are united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Christus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the house of Stephan, uh, Stephanus. Uh, and beyond that, I do not know where I, whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with the words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So there are two issues here that I, I, I want to bring up to you in this this passage of the first in the first chapter. Issue number one is Christians were taking sides and following certain leaders, which was causing division in the church. And Paul rebuked the people and advised that they should not be taking sides and saying one's teaching or preaching is better than the other. Now, that's a hard statement to accept, isn't it, right? Why? Because, you know, we all have our biases, and that's that was demonstrated in that exercise we did earlier in, in the sermon today. I mean, you have, when in choosing to attend Crucible Church, you know, it being a member of the Christian Missionary Alliance denomination, it also has its biases. So how does this passage help us understand choosing a particular denomination or maybe non-denomination? How does it help us choose a Bible teacher, a pastor, leader? And you know, should I be loyal to the denomination, that group, or that preacher? are things to, to think about, but let's let's briefly look at the leaders Paul was referring to. So the first leader being Paul himself. Isn't it legitimate to say that I follow Paul? You know, his followers, 
followers would say something like, you know, we're following in the footsteps of this guy who founded the Corinthian church. So we're the ones that are really right with God. But Paul says, you know what? I'm nothing compared to Christ. I'm not important. And saying that I baptized you is nothing to brag about. Right? Paul says preaching the gospel is what God sent me to do. And that's what it's really all about. So there's a second guy that people have been following, and his name is Apollos. He's mentioned in the book of Acts, and he's described this way. He's a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. So the people that were following Apollos would, would argue, so we're following this cool guy who's great in power, and he has all these spiritual gifts. He's very impressive. He speaks really great. So we're, we must be the ones that are following and uh, are, are really right with God. Hmm. Let's move on to, to Peter. Or Cephas is the Aramaic for Peter. So Peter, his followers were mainly these Jewish uh, people from Jerusalem. And Peter's followers would argue something like this. We're following in the footsteps of this guy who was one of the first apostles. He was in close contact with Jesus. And Jesus said, you know, I'm, I'm going to give Paul, uh, Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This, this has to be our guy. He's the one that really makes us right with God. We're following his teaching. Hmm. And then lastly, uh, there was a group that was claiming to follow the Messiah. Christ. And the people that are following Christ directly, they would say something like, all of you other people, you're so carnal, you're following mere men. We're following in the footsteps of no one less than Jesus Christ himself. We're the ones that are really right with God. Which group is right? Which group is right? Well, before we can answer that question, Paul inserts this, this bold question has Christ been divided? Has Christ been divided? What does that mean? Well, to put it in the context of our modern day, we can say, uh, we can divide Christ if we choose to play this game of, my preacher is better than your preacher. But Christ isn't divided. And Jesus' true followers should not allow themselves, allow anything to divide them. Friends, don't be, don't be led into intellectual pride in saying that the teacher, the pastor, or the author that I follow or that you follow is better than yours. Because simply, our loyalty, loyalty must be to Christ and the, unit, and the unity he desires for his church. Following Jesus is the answer. Men are just servants of God which lead us, which basically leads us to the second issue that I want to talk about. Issue number two is, why are people following certain leaders? The teachings we follow or, or what we believe in is very much based on our worldview, is it not? So I talked about that a little earlier. Our worldview is a view of the world and it's, it's used for living in the world. It's this mental model of reality. And incorporated into this worldview is our value system, what we place important in our lives. A person's worldview is affected by many factors. It could be their inherited characteristics, their background experiences, their life situations, values, attitudes, habits they've developed over time. But this is what helps us, this worldview, it helps us make sense uh, of a wide, wide range of questions like, why are we here? What's our purpose in life? Where can our time be spent wisely? Can we know God exists? Does, the, does God exist? You know, how does God play a part in our lives if he does? Think of worldview as a set of lenses we see through 
in order to make decisions. How important, how important is it to actually see through the correct set of lenses? Well, it's extremely important. You see by this picture, this is my son Jax, who's about three, year old, three, uh, three years old at the time. And he, I gave him a pair of sunglasses which was really bright in the car. And he goes in and puts it on, upside down. Well, it, you know, in this case, it's not gonna make that much of a difference, except you look sort of weird, right? But can you imagine if you are a nearsighted or farsighted person, and then an optometrist prescribes you the wrong power of glasses, and then maybe even adds in a dark tint? It means living in a world that is blurry, dark, and maybe even upside down, right? But it's funny that many times we consciously choose to wear the wrong set of lenses, don't we? And what happens? We end up stumbling in the darkness and ultimately cause our own destruction. The worldviews affect our decisions and actions in everyday life. And we see this in this first chapter. It was definitely causing a division. So Paul rebukes those believers who are, are trying to cling on to their Greek and Jewish worldviews. And, and this is found in the, the following verses, verses 18 to 31. We already talked about the importance of that the Greeks placed on knowledge and wisdom. You see, Greeks had this problem of understanding the teachings of an atoning death. Death to them was defeat. It wasn't victory. See, Jesus paled in comparison to their mythological, powerful gods. And they thought, there's, there's no reputable person that would be, want to be crucified. And as far as bodily resurrection, that's, that's simply illogical. That's absurd. Jesus and his teachings were, quote, unquote, foolishness to the Gentiles, Greeks. And they thought, how could the son of a carpenter from a, a town like Nazareth, who never studied in Athens or Rome, be of much intellect? Intellectual pride was the Greeks' problem. And then you have the other group, the Jewish vision, where it's based on the knowledge of the Torah, the law of Moses. And their legalistic beliefs, there was no room to accept this doctrine of a crucified Messiah. In verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 23, it talks about a stumbling block to the Jews. This, this idea of a crucified uh, Messiah, uh, Messiah is something they couldn't accept or understand. Because it, it displayed weakness. They didn't understand how weakness could be a source of power. And the cross to them was also uh, something that was a symbol of failure. And much like people of today, Jews worship success. Jews were looking for conquering, a conquering king in the Messiah. And that was their problem. The Bible says, whether Greek or Jew or the wisdom of today, it is all folly compared to the wisdom of God. The Corinthian church had this Christian worldview, but unfortunately, it was contaminated with their old worldviews. There was this elitist attitude. This my wisdom, my knowledge is superior to yours. They're following the wisdom of men, and not to mention uh, gratification of self, you know, the lust of the flesh. You know, brothers and sisters, let's face it. In any church, there will always be some disagreements. A group of people will not completely agree on every issue, but church unity is still possible if you can agree on truly what matters, and that's this, that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. So I encourage you to speak in, and behave in ways that will reduce arguments and increase harmony because petty differences should never divide Christians. Amen? Amen. And what it boils down to is this. We seek the wisdom of God and there you will find the truth. What truth? The truth about who Jesus Christ is. He is God. The truth about what Jesus Christ did. He was crucified. He died on the cross for you and me. 
And through that cross of Christ, we will know God's power. We will also know what Jesus Christ is continually doing in us, transforming us into his likeness. The fancy word for this is called sanctification. It's being set apart, becoming holy like Jesus. And if we apply God's wisdom to this problem of divisions, it becomes pretty clear that human leaders are merely servants of Jesus. And Jesus is the one we should pledge our allegiance to. So as I conclude my sermon today, I just want to emphasize that Paul is saying he wants this Corinthian church to bring it to basically bring it back to what he first taught them, that the gospel is Jesus Christ and the power of the cross, and our lives should be centered on him. Jesus is the foundation. We sang about this earlier. He's our cornerstone on whom we should base our worldviews. You know, the, the old stuff, the old wisdom, the wisdom of man, cultures, you know, this tradition, they all pale in in comparison to the wisdom of God. When we become Christians, our worldview must be seen through the lenses of the gospel and not the wisdom of man. Another way of describing the Christian worldview is, is basically to have the mind of Christ, which is the wisdom of the Spirit. And brothers and sisters, I pray that you would consciously put on this set of lenses daily, that your words, your actions might reflect the beauty of Jesus Christ to those around you. Jesus is so important to Paul that he mentions his name eight times in the first nine verses of chapter one. And I'd like to conclude with this quote from the book that you uh, will be reading um, in your small roots, Paul for Everyone by N.T. Wright. So I quote, Paul couldn't stop talking about Jesus because without Jesus, nothing else he said or did made any sense. And what he wants the Corinthians to get hold of most of all is what it means to have Jesus at the middle of your story, your life, your thoughts, your imagination. Let's pray. Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for revealing this truth Really, this truth that your wisdom is superior to ours. And that we should put on or have the mind of Christ as we journey through our lives in this world. To be able to see through the lens of the gospel. And to be able to interact and respond to this world um, by things by saying things, by doing things that Christ would have done. Father, well, thank you for showing us in your word today that Jesus is this should be the center, should be our cornerstone in all that we do. And I pray that we would be constantly reminded of this daily. We pray this in Jesus' name.